facilities equipped to treat those suffering from severe mental illness are overwhelmed in San Diego County. What can be done about the growing problem? Toxic dust storms and an epidemic of asthma cases loom as California's largest lake, the Salton Sea, dries up. And residents in an affluent neighborhood west of Lindbergh Field are furious, believing that the planes overhead are about to get even noisier. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are KPBS Health reporter Kenny Goldberg. Hi, Kenny. Hey, Mark. Good to see you back. Tony Perry, San Diego Bureau Chief for the Los Angeles Times. Hey, Tony. Hey. And reporter Steve Walsh of KPBS News. Hi, Steve. Welcome. Hey, Mark. It's good to see you. Well, the costs associated with severe mental illness in the U.S. are estimated to be more than $300 billion a year but the relatively few facilities able to offer long-term care for mentally ill patients are overwhelmed in San Diego County. These are among the facts reported in a three-part series on mental illness airing this week on KPBS. Kenny, that was a great series. Let's start with the scope of this problem. How many folks suffer from severe mental illness? Well, the group NAMI says about one out of 17 Americans have a severe mental illness. So if you do the numbers in San Diego County, that means about 188,000 people have a serious mental illness like uh, schizophrenia or borderline personality disorder or severe depression. So All right, a lot so, of people. Yeah, let's expand a little bit on that definition. What are we talking about severe mental illness as opposed to somebody who's kind of functioning with depression or maybe uh, bipolar to a degree, but what's severe mental illness? Well, a severe mental illness is like a psychotic mental illness. So the very sort of at the, there's spectrum of mental illnesses and, and severe are at the, uh, at the far end. Okay. So, so like schizophrenia, somebody who has uh, delusions. Hears and, voices. Uh, hears voices. Might have episodes that, that uh, they're, they're crises in their lives, right? Yes. Okay. So you, uh, you visited the Scripps Mercy emergency room for your report. We got a bite here from Dr. Ronit Lev. Let's, let's hear how she ex examines what's going on there. We have 55 people in our emergency department right now. I see there's two people here on a psychiatric 5150 hold. We have a person here with anxiety. Um, if I scroll down, there we could see here suicidal, 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 suicidal. Well, uh, that's, you know, a pretty uh, dramatic, dramatic bite there. Many people suffering from uh, psychotic episodes end up in the ER, but uh, your, your story show that's really not the right place for them. No, it isn't. I mean, uh, emergency room people can stabilize somebody who's in crisis with a mental illness, but it's not the ideal place for somebody who's suffering from an episode of mental illness, especially acute, because it's a very chaotic environment. There's a lot of noises. There's a lot of people rushing around, and it's just not conducive to, to mental health in there at all. So what we need is to put these folks in a long-term facility, lock facility. How many do we have, and how many do we need? There's quite a shortage. Well, we have a uh, total in the county, because they just added capacity a few months ago. We've got, I think, just under 200 long-term care beds. Now, there are other facilities, like board and care homes, for people that have severe mental illness, but they have to be a little bit more high-functioning to stay in one of those places because they're usually not locked. And some of them, if they're licensed, do offer medication, but there's no other treatment. There's no group sessions, there's no uh, therapy per se, anything like that, so. Tony? First, uh, let me uh, second uh, Mark's comment. Great reporting, Thank you. important reporting. Uh, now, it does seem, as I read your excellent work, that once again, San Diego County has a social problem, health problem, that needs surgery. What we have is Band-Aids. Is that cutting to the chase too much? Have we just flopped on dealing with this societal issue? Uh, I don't think we flopped, but uh, it hasn't gotten the attention it's deserved, uh, I think. And, but it's not only in San Diego. It's not only a problem in San Diego. This is statewide. Uh, there's a real problem with a number of people with mental illness, and we just don't have the resources to take care of them, despite the fact that uh, 10 years or so ago, we passed Prop 63, the millionaire's tax, which gives uh, uh, special money for mental health services, and I get into that into part three. But this money, which is a lot of money every year for the county and other counties, can't be used to supplement existing services. It has to go to new programs, it has to go to programs to prevent mental illness, to uh, intervene early in people with mental illness. So it's, it's a matter of resources, it's a matter of priorities. But the county, 
uh, to its credit, is trying to, 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 uh, to do what it can. So who's on the front lines here? Would would seem as if police officers are dealing with this issue day in, day out. How does it impact them, and is there any hope in sight for them? Well, as you were saying uh, before the show started, the uh, calls to service in San Diego police have skyrocketed in just the past year from mental illness calls. They have these things called PERT teams that go out with the San Diego police officers where there's an actual mental health professional that takes a ride along with the uh, the officer in their car, and they uh, they go to mental health calls and try to defuse the situation, try to get somebody help, try to get them in treatment. So the police department is reaching out too, but it, it's... Uh, it's a problem that, that uh, hits all parts of society, not and, just the police. And we're getting more patients than before, and, and you report in your story that's because of the Affordable Care Act. How well, that's that? one theory. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got millions of more people in California now that have insurance thanks to Medi-Cal, and so they're accessing the, the uh, health care system. Uh, many of them, believe it or not, just don't really know how to, how to get a doctor, how to, how to uh, get care. So they, the first thing they do is they show up in the emergency room. Never had insurance before. Huh? Right. Um, now, do those with severe mental illness, do they get better with treatment? Does it work? They do. Yeah. Uh, if they get proper treatment and they're diligent about it. Uh, when I visited the county's main long-term care facility in Alpine, the director there said even the severely impaired do improve. They don't improve necessarily to the point where they could function independently and take care of themselves, but they do get better. Why Alpine? Is that, are we trying to keep these folks as far away from their families as possible? Alpine? Mm, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a private facility that the, the county contracts with. It happens to be there. It happens to be a very uh, calm setting, relaxed, and they have the facilities. Uh, as to historically why they chose to put it there, I, I don't have any idea. Steve? No, bottom line, Kenny, does this mean that people who are suicidal, suicidal, suicidal might just end up back on the streets after visiting the ER? Oh, certainly, because you see, the ER is only one part of it, and then they have to be discharged someplace, uh, hopefully to a place that can give them more acute care, but the acute care hospitals are pretty full. Um, and then if somebody needs uh, long-term care, they have a, a deep psychiatric illness. It's just not manageable at the present time. They have to get long-term care. So there's, uh, they're almost at capacity every place uh, in the system, and that's, that's one of the issues. And you write about uh, early intervention and the Kickstart program. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, now that's an interesting program. There's a program in San Diego that's funded by that Prop 63 millionaires tax money primarily, and it seeks to uh, intervene in kids ages 10 to 25 that have had some signs of psychotic illness. So they've experienced hallucinations, they're hearing voices before it becomes a full-blown mental illness. And this program has had some success in over about an 18-month period with kids in uh, reducing these symptoms and actually preventing them from getting a full-blown mental illness. What do county officials say? I mean, is there any help on the way? Is there more money or money or more uh, staff that we can uh, apply here? Well, the county has a lot of Prop 63 unspent money, uh, more than $100 million that's unspent. Well, it sounds like a whole bunch. I mean, why aren't we uh, spending and using it? Well, because, uh, again, that money has to go to very specific programs. It can't supplement existing programs. It can't fill budget holes. And there's a very rigorous process to get... Uh, programs approved for this money. It's a very rigorous process. All right, in the time we had left, I did want to kind of throw up in one question here. We're having somewhat of a national debate on severe mental illness here because of all these mass shootings we've had, more than one a day this year so far, four people are more killed. It's remarkable, the numbers, of course. Uh, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say that, that I, I know most people with severe mental illness are not violent people. The studies have shown that. But um, what about this national debate? Can we get some help for folks? I mean, how do you predict human behavior? It's such a, a conundrum, this problem facing society. Right. You can't predict human behavior. But I think this speaks to an overall problem that uh, we're just not taking care of people with severe mental illnesses. It shouldn't get to that point. Right where someone is so disturbed that they feel their only option is to, is to uh, kill other people. Act out. I mean, that's, and, that's and, a, and in a society where we have, as we well know, access to guns and high-powered guns. Uh, or they do something that puts them uh, near police officers with guns, and we have an officer-involved shooting, and then right. we have a controversy. Right. We have one going now, as we right. know. Right. So it's... Suicide by cop is the phrase that she was quoting. Yeah, or just an incident that occurs... Mm -hmm. because things weren't right mm -hmm. with an individual, and now suddenly we have to decide, was the police officer 
-hmm. in the right and the wrong, what do we do? Right. And, you know, I think it also speaks to this, uh, in every mental health piece I do, almost every one, I talk about stigma. I think it's still persistent. It's within families that have a, a, a person who suffers maybe from a mental illness. There's just a real uh, barrier and a prejudice against getting care, uh, against somebody who has a mental illness. And uh, well, we're, we're going to leave you with a last word on this segment there. I encourage the audience to go to kpbs.org and, and, and look at the series. It's terrific stuff. We'll shift gears now. It's California's largest lake, a briny sump in the desert east of here that uh, soon will begin drying up. And that will create a public health catastrophe uh, unless something is done to preserve the Salton Sea. Tony, uh, tell us, uh, first of all, why does the sea uh, start figuring? I know it's shrinking now. We'll get to that in a minute. But in 2017, it's really going to start. It Indeed, the Salton Sea, 35 miles uh, long, 15 miles wide, uh, straddling the Imperial and Riverside County lines. In 2003, the state and the federal government twisted the arms of the farmers out in the Imperial Valley to sell a lot of water to the San Diego County Water Authority. Now, less water being used on the crops, less runoff, the sea starts to shrink even more than it has been. Because that's the main source of water out there. It's the only source yeah, of water. Unless we get some rain. Uh, there's no fresh water uh, source that mm -hmm. goes into that sea. So to keep the sea from shrinking uh, dramatically for the first 15 years of that 45-year uh, deal, uh, the Imperial Irrigation District is, is required to put Salton, uh, put uh, Colorado River water directly into the sea to keep it from shrinking. It's still shrinking. Mm. Uh, but after 2017, that requirement goes away. And suddenly, the shrinkage, which has been apace, will increase. The people at the Pacific Institute and Enviro... Uh, uh, study group in Oakland, they say we're looking at a catastrophe. We're falling off the edge of the table. The sea will have shrunk. That playa that was underwater will suddenly be uh, uh, exposed to the air. And the dust storms, which are already enormous out there, will get only worse. Dust storms with things in it from pesticides through the ages that were used on the crops that, that went into the sea. Suddenly the playa is exposed. The wind comes along. And the uh, asthma rates and the emergency room uh, admission rates, particularly for children in the Imperial Valley, are astronomical. They're already gone up, and they're going to go way up if this nothing Indeed, and I <clears throat> talked to the man who's recently been hired by the state to take over Salton Sea planning, and he said it's an environmental uh, catastrophe. It's an environmental invalid out there. And he says the dust storms today are like... Uh, a Midwestern mm -hmm. snowstorm, mm -hmm. except it's particles, and it's going to get worse. Or the Dust Bowl, you speak of the Midwest. Let's uh, talk about uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, the state promised to do something about <laughs> it. What were the plans, and what's been done? In 2003, again, the farmers really didn't want to sell their water to uh, San Diego County Water Authority. But to force them to, a couple of things, uh, the federal government sued them. But also the state government said, okay, in terms of the Salton Sea now, you... You put some of that Colorado River water, some of your Colorado River water, into the sea and stabilize it for the first 15. We'll take it from there. Well, here we are almost 15 years later. They're not taking it from and there. And the state has not taken it from there because, let's be candid about it, it just doesn't have the political uh, push of uh, Sacramento, San Francisco, Del Delta, the Delta, uh, right. uh, even, the, even the Central Valley. It just yeah. doesn't. So even, here we are. even Owens Lake, which is a similar exactly. problem up there in the uh, foothills of the Sierra. Exactly. It they... doesn't get the press, and it isn't, doesn't have the political push. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why Kenny? haven't uh, environmental groups made this one of their causes? They should, I think. But there's only so much energy to go around. They'll tell you that the Delta is the big uh, thing that they're concerned about, the, Sacro, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Uh, also, uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay. There just isn't enough energy around. And also, it's a long way away from San Diego, Los Angeles, a uh, long way away from Northern California. But also, it's, it's a man-made problem on a man-made lake, and we're in the middle of a drought. Water is pretty scarce. I mean, is there anything that can be done short of giving, putting more water in there? Can you rehab any of this land that's surrounding this shrinking sea? A bit, and that's what the Bruce Wilcox man recently hired as a... Um, the Salton Sea Czar. Yeah, czar, <laughs> czar without much of a pinch, uh, without much of a... No budget. money and no staff. Yeah, huh? no yeah. staff. Uh, yes, uh, they've got a little bit of money. 
The state <laughs> cooked up a plan some years ago for $9 billion to save the sea. Well, that was dead on arrival at the uh, state legislature. Uh, Imperial Irrigation District, along with the Imperial uh, County Board of Supervisors, they cooked up another plan about $3.5 billion, similarly dead. But what is alive is a much smaller program. For example, there's about a 420-acre uh, site there on the southeastern part. Uh, they're going to reflood it with Alamo River water uh, and, and stop the playa from getting out. Now, that's 420 acres out of thousands of acres at the moment, let alone after 2017. The hope is they'll do this little project, little project, right. several million dollars. It'll, it'll work. work and it'll wake people up. Hey, we can do something. We can't save the sea. But is there any but way to stabilize reclaim, it? Is there any way to reclaim the land around there? I mean, a hundred years ago, this was all you know it open land. It, it was. You're right. You're exactly right. And uh, it was a salt sink, is what it was. And then comes along the uh, the uh, great floods uh, caused by uh, the Colorado jumping its bank because of irrigation uh, methods that didn't work. But returning it to what it was, I think, is tough. Also, leaving uh, exposed to the air the playa, that white dust, uh, with all the health downside and with all the economic downside. Uh, as the Pacific Institute people say, fixing the sea or even stabilizing the sea is very, very expensive, not doing it even more so in terms of employment, uh, health, you name it. So. You got yourself a Hobson's choice. Yeah. Pay me your, now. Pay me a lot more later. Right, and because your your story was reporting is some some estimates what thirty to seventy billion over thirty years are what the health costs is, is what would be lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where, where's Governor Brown on all this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, came he did uh, to San Diego uh, during the the uh, water bond uh, last year, and so I went up to him wearing my Salton Sea hat. I'm going to point out, <laughs> and I said, Governor Brown, Salton Sea, what do you think? You tell me you live in a trailer park out there, and <laughs> <laughs> we'll deal with that later," he said. And it's now later, uh -huh. and the uh, folks from the Imperial Irrigation District went to the state water board about six months ago and said, "You got to do something." What they would like, they would like the board to condition the continuing sale of water to San Diego on fixing the sea. Well, the board may or may not even have that authority, let alone the political moxie. They went back a couple weeks ago and said, "Hey." You've done nothing, uh -huh. nothing. Well, what is the federal any? role, if any, in this whole affair? Good, good question. Now, uh, they are going to name their own czar, the Bureau of Reclamation, which runs, of course, the, uh, the Colorado River and disperses the, the water therefrom. Uh, so far, they haven't done a lot, although they have had some money for this little 420-acre project on what is called the Red Hill Bay on the southeastern corner. And so they're involved to see if this can work. Can we reflood? areas. So the thought is, Bruce Wilcox, the man who's been named the czar by the state uh, natural resources uh, department, uh, let's do smaller projects. We're never going to make the sea what it once was when it was the place for the Hollywood crowd. It really was in the 1950s. Sinatra and the rest of them went out there playing and drinking and going to various places that are all bankrupt now. Uh, we're never going to make it that, but let's see if we can stabilize it and save some of it so that it doesn't get one heck of a lot worse after 2017 when they no longer are putting fresh water from the Colorado River right to the sea. All right, that, we'll have to leave it there, but we'll watch for some more reporting on that. Maybe the El Nino rains will help this winter, who knows. Well, the location of Lindbergh Field between downtown and San Diego and Point Loma has been a sore point for decades, especially for those living beneath the flight path. It's hardly surprising that a proposal by the FAA to tighten the takeoff pattern, putting planes over neighborhoods as they bank back to the east, has riled up Point Loma residents. Steve, start with this hearing this week. How many people showed up and what was the scene there? Well, it was certainly over 300. I'm going to guess 500. Some of the estimates mm -hmm. were even more. They certainly packed it in over at Liberty Station. Um, a lot of residents are, are quite upset by this proposal by the FAA, which is something that's going on actually around the country. They're looking at metro areas all over the country as part of their, it's called their Next Gen Plan, which is basically to use, uh, to tighten up the airspace around several metro areas um, using satellite technology. Really, it's a switch to GPS and satellite tracking for planes. Some areas of the country, this has received a lot of uh, consternation, and other areas, it looks like Houston, they don't seem to have many problems with it at all. In fact, there hadn't been a lot of problems with it in San Diego, 
um, up until recently, over the last couple of weeks, it looks like residents have gotten really excited about this. They're very concerned. Some of them are saying that they think this has already changed. They're seeing more planes right now. And right. yeah, it, Point Loma is right off the tip of the runway. So And hundreds of planes a day take off. And, and we should eat. point out, because of our prevailing winds, unless it's actually a full-blown Santa Ana, 97% of the time uh, in your story said that the planes are taking off into the wind prevailing off the ocean. So they're going over that neighborhood and now they're going to make this tighter turn. Tell, explain to, to the listeners uh, exactly what we're talking about. They're not going to swing so wide out over the ocean west, right? Right, because they can they can tighten up these uh, this airspace. They, they still go out over Ocean Beach and most planes traveling east go bank out over the ocean, swing around. They swing out right now past Point Loma, the tip of Point Loma, and then come back and start heading east. Under this proposal, they would be able to bank more tightly. They would come over the tip of Point Loma and also in the process, those planes would be a little closer to the coastline as they make that and a little around. lower before they and lower before they go climbing out, out yeah. yeah so you residents are definitely concerned though uh, though some of their concerns seem to be whether or not planes are starting to go into different neighborhoods that they hadn't seen planes before and I'm not that, sure uh, why are we doing this is this to save gas and therefore money? The it does indeed. Um, looks like nationwide, the next gen plan is supposed to save some like 800, uh, 648,000 nautical miles annually, about 3 million gallons of fuel, and uh, carbon emissions cut by 31,000 tons a, a year. Of course, this is nationwide. Uh, they haven't done studies that show just how. Uh, what the breakdown is. Huh? What the breakdown is for <clears throat> each airport. Kenny, did you have a question? What alternatives uh, have they considered? Uh, well, the status the, quo, right I now guess. is that's, is they're considering all the alternatives. This is a proposed plan. The public uh, comment period for this proposed plan uh, that the, uh, the public comment period passed on Thursday. So now they're looking at all of these different plans, including, of course, as with every federal program, the the option of no change. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Tony, FAA is a uh, federal agency. It is. Can our robust uh, San Diego congressional delegation do anything about this or not? Well, um, it is an FAA proposal. Um, I'm sure they can chime in. I'm sure we can write letters to, to uh, the FAA in Washington. Uh, the, the meeting this, uh, this last week was actually not an FAA meeting at all. It was actually called by the, uh, the airport, and they asked the FAA to come. And so they seem to be somewhat responsive, at least, to, to local well, public I thought the comment. FAA got... F got the rear ends roasted for not being as prepared as some of the advocates would have liked. Oh, indeed. I mean, they, you cert they certainly didn't answer all their questions. And I'm sort of skirting, like, where exactly these runways? It's very difficult just to look at all the different maps out there to see, you know, exactly where all of these planes are, are going to go. So they certainly didn't satisfy the concerns of residents. There was also another side element where, since this was an airport meeting, not an FAA meeting, people who commented at that meeting, their comments aren't automatically included in the whole proposal, so they would have to go back and comment again if they wanted to be part of it. Kenny? In, in what sense is this just another uh, NIMBY argument, so to speak? In other words, I mean, a few years ago, what, what we had that vote on uh, moving the commercial airport to uh, Miramar Field, but then that would have affected some different people and they would have complained. So. Well, I, I will tell you, I'm new to San Diego, but I will say the, the airport runways are, and flight patterns in San Diego are a major topic. We were actually just talking about this segment at our, the morning meeting at the station, and where there was a station tour, and when it came, when Mark brought it up, there was some applause in the background. <laughs> people just visiting in the newsroom. And I asked those people if they were from Point Loma, and they said, oh, no, we actually live right around the university, but they felt that the flight patterns had either uh, become more numerous or had changed. Well, yeah, as Kenny notes, I mean, this, is, this airport thing has been going on 50 years. 50 years after we're dead, Tony, they'll be having committees. I think I arrived here in 1979, and the first story I wrote was about airport noise and point <laughs> A committee going to study it, yeah. Now, the, can the airport authority, which is a public agency, although not publicly elected, can they say no? Can they tell the airlines, who are their customers, can they say, don't make those turns? Um, well, what they say, and, and they're not commenting much publicly, but they're responding to some emails that this is the FAA's prerogative, that they're the ones that set these flight Ouch. patterns, they're the ones that do this, that they can address concerns, that if ultimately if the sound levels do go up, they could qualify for some local programs, some sound mitigation, pro though at the, the moment the FAA is saying that there won't be any significant effect from these changes. Wasn't there a Jenny? proposal a few years ago 
to do a floating airport? Yes, Remember indeed. That? Oh, Peter, Alpine and the yes. bullet train to Alpine, the floating airport, Miramar, as you yeah, mentioned. That's the I end mean, of it. They have a, in other words, they're floating out in the, <laughs> off the coast. Nobody gets upset. Yeah, and the costs were... Uh, or even send them over to, uh, float them over to uh, North Island, yeah. for example. I'm, we've we've been wrestling this right after we fixed the salt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or, and uh, I'm against this totally because I live in Encinitas, the Carlsbad Airport. The Carlsbad. Yeah. Or Carmel Valley. Gillespie Field, Brownfield. They've uh, talked about all of these places. Yeah, and once we deal with this, we can deal with, do we need a second runway? And how about the board? How about uh, yeah, the Rodriguez? Yeah, Airport. And, yeah. Right. Uh, this is a full employment act for uh, reporters yeah, yeah. covering yeah. this issue. Yeah, committee well, you members. see recent airports like Denver and, and Reagan National. I mean, having an airport that's half an hour, 45 yeah. minutes, an hour out Typical. of a major city. Yeah. I, I think the Denver awesome. airport is in Kansas, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I've been to it. Like well, <laughs> we're going to leave it with, uh, with Kansas and the Denver airport there. Thank you very much. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, Kenny Goldberg of KPBS News, Tony Perry of the Los Angeles Times, and Steve Walsh of of KPBS News. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.